you are to us. And Father, I just ask that you anoint your handmaiden to give the message that you have for us. I am so excited about this message that you have. So Father, we open our hearts and ears to receive all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So is blessing biblical? There are actually over 42 scriptures on blessing. So I just, just picked just a few to get to the point that a blessing is biblical. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 22 is the first occurrence. And this is when God blessed the sea creatures and birds, telling them to be fruitful and to multiply. And then Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 says, God gave a similar blessing to Adam and Eve, adding that they were to exercise dominion over the earth. And then Genesis chapter 1 verses 1, I mean 12 verses 1 through 3, when God called Abram to go to the promised land, he promised to bless him, make his name great, and through him to bless all the families of the earth. The blessings here are plainly associated with happiness and welfare, both to Abram and to others. And then Genesis chapter 22, verses 16 through 18, God again blesses Abram and adds that the blessing is due to his obedience to God's commands. God doesn't bless us when we live in a compromised life. He blesses us when we leave live in obedience to him. And then in Genesis chapter 24, verse 60, God is not the only one who pronounces blessings. When Rebecca left her family to become Isaac's wife, her family blessed her by saying, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring possess the gates of their enemies. And then chapter 27, verses 29, 28 through 29, when Isaac was ready to die, to die, he pronounced his blessing on his son Jacob, who he thought was Esau. May God give you of heaven's dew and of earth's richness, and abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother <coughs> bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and may those you bless be blessed. And so then I picked one from uh, in the New Testament, in Mark chapter 10, verses 13. One day, some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. So is it scriptural? So what is blessing according to the Bible? Well, in the Webster Dictionary, a blessing is the act of words of one that blesses or a thing conducive to happiness or welfare. So what does that Bible mean to bless? In the Bible, there are several words that usually translate as blessing or bless. The Hebrew word often used translated bless is barak. I hope I'm saying that right. B-A-R-A-K. Which can mean to praise congratulate or salute the importance of the blessing. All of us long to be accepted by others. While we may say out loud, I don't care what other people think about me on the inside, we all yearn for intimacy and affection. This yearning is especially true in our relationship with our parents. Gaining or missing out on parental approval has a tremendous effect on us, even if it's been years since we have had any contact with your parents. In fact, what happens in our relationships with our parents can greatly affect all our present and future relationships. In Genesis 27, verse 28, Bless me, me also, O my father, which was Esau, in Old Testament times, a father's blessing was irrevocable once it was given. So now Isaac's blessing was forever outside of Esau's reach. You can feel the anguish in Esau's cry as he cried out the second time, Bless me, me also, oh my father. That 
same painful cry. An unfulfilled longing is being echoed today by many people who are searching for their family's blessing. Men and women whose parents, for whatever reason, have failed to bless them with words of love and acceptance. And Dr. Trent shared this story. It has now been more than 30 years since two intensely personal experiences co coincide on the same day. It began on my first day as an intern at a psychiatric hospital. It ended with the Lord opening my eyes to the life-changing power of a simple relational tool called the blessing. That day at the hospital, I spent a full shift next to a young man on 24-hour suicidal watch. He was tall, handsome, well-mannered, and an excellent student. In fact, he had been a straight-A student in high school and for three years of college. When he caught the flu in the first semester of his senior year, all that changed. In a required PE course he had put off until then, he missed so many classes that his instructor gave him an automatic grade and a reduction to B you know, for that semester. When the young man found out there was no extra credit, no ways to substitute other classes, and now no way to change his grade or even to drop the course, he fell in instant despair. He left the teacher's office, went back to his dorm room, and tried to take his life. He would have succeeded had his roommate not unexpectedly and providentially returned. Dr. Trent says, as I sat and talked, and as I tried not to stare at his bandaged wrists, this young man poured out his heart to me. His story included a brilliant, demanding, engineer father who had gotten straight A's himself and demanded nothing less from his old son. It highlighted how hard he had tried all his life to gain his father's favor. And ultimately it led to how his failing to get an A in a tennis class brought the death of a dream and nearly his own death as well. This young man desperately yearned for something he couldn't quite define. Something that was always in sight, yet somehow never within reach. His heartbreaking tale left a haunting, indelible impression on me. While I still pondering and processing what had happened, the second of two dramatic events took place. It was nighttime, and when I finally sat down and began working on a message for a couple Sunday school class for the next day, looking back, I can see Almighty God's hand in this timing. After sitting down for hours next to that hurting young man, I now sat down and opened my Bible to Genesis 27. Genesis 27 tells the story of twins. Jacob and Esau. I read of the struggle between the two brothers countless times in the past. My plan was to speed read through that passage and throw together a few inspired thoughts. Yet that night, with each word I tried, I read, the time seemed to slow down. It was as if I, I saw for the first time the intensely personal story of how these two young men struggled so mightily to receive the same gift that blessing. I suddenly saw not only Esau's unfulfilled longing and broken heart, but also the echoes of the tears and desperate cries I had heard as I sat next to the broken-hearted young man in the hospital. And at that moment, it was at that the Lord put tangible words to the intangible, to something that young man had longed for all his life. He missed his father's blessing, and that's what broke his heart. 
life or death choice. The scripture gives us choices. So one choice is life and the other choice is death. In Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 teaches us, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. That fruit is consequences. Good consequences. You choose. Kind words breed warmth of relationship. Hard words bring tension and separation. True words build trust and confidence. Lies break trust, and doubt and suspicion replace confidence. You can create a hell on earth, or you can create a heaven on earth just by the words you speak. <coughs> and when I'm in counseling with couples, and those that choose a hell on earth, I shake my head. What? What? So when it comes to relationships, you have two choices. You can choose life, and you're choosing to move toward the other person. If you choose death, you're choosing to step away from that relationship. So choose to be an encourager, not a discourager. Choose to speak words of life, not death. <coughs> to bless or to curse. Another choice in scripture. The first picture containing in the Hebrew word for bless is that of bowing the knee. And that's in Genesis chapter 24, verse 11. Actually, it uses the word to describe a camel who must bend its knees so its master can get on. So bowing before someone is a graphic picture of valuing that person. And that second biblical word picture for the word bless also carries the idea of adding weight or value to someone. So literally, it's a picture of adding coins to a scale. Putting these two pictures together, you are basically saying, you are such value to me, I choose to add to your life. The word for curse literally means a trickle or muddy stream caused by a dam or obstruction upstream. In Old Testament days, living in desert lands, cutting off water meant cutting off life itself. When we curse somebody, we are choosing to dam up the stream on life-giving actions and words that could flow down to that person. There are the five elements of the blessing meaningful and appropriate touch, a spoken word message, attaching high value to the one being blessed, picturing a special future for him or her, an active commitment to fulfill that blessing. And you could go to the blessing website that shows you these uh, five elements, or they, they even partner with Focus on the Family, and they have a website on the blessing. Well, there's even lots of YouTubes with fathers blessing their children. It's so moving. Or you can get the book, The Blessing, by Dr. Trent. So for your own personal study or a Bible study with a small group or Lord willing, next spring, I'll be offering it in this church. So let's look at each of those five elements individually. Meaningful touch has an essential element in bestowing the blessing in Old Testament homes. So it was with Isaac when he went to bless his son. So we read in chapter uh, Genesis chapter 27, verse 26, six, that Isaac said, Come near me now and kiss me, my son. This incident was not an isolated one. Each time the blessing was given in the scriptures, a meaningful touch provided a caring background to the words that would be spoken. Kissing, hugging, or the laying on hands were all a part of bestowing the blessing. So meaningful touch has many beneficial effects. So the act of touch is key in communicating warmth, personal acceptance, affirmation, 
even physical health. So the second element of the blessing involves a spoken message, one that is actually put into words. In many homes today, such words of love and acceptance are seldom received. Parents in these homes assume that simply being present communicates the blessing. That's a tragic mistake. A blessing fulfills its purpose only when it's actually verbalized, spoken in person, or written down, preferably both of those. The third element of the blessing is attaching high value. And blessing Jacob, thinking it was Esau, Isaac said, surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. So this picture is a very valuable person. Not just anybody merits having nations bow down to them. Now why we might think that calling a person a field really would be criticizing him. But that's not the case. A blessed field was one where there was tremendous growth and life and reward. The fourth element of the blessing is the way it pictures a special vision for the person being blessed. Isaac said to his son Jacob, May God give you the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Even today, Jewish homes are noted for picturing a special um, future for their children. So this is one story I heard. It said, Seidel, a young Jewish mother, was proudly walking down the street, pushing a stroller with her infant twins. As she rounded the corner, she saw her neighbor, Sarah. And Sarah said, my, what beautiful children. What are their names? Seidel said, pointing to each child, this is Benjamin, the doctor, and this is Reuben, the lawyer. <laughs> Our Lord himself, himself <coughs> speaks quite eloquently about our future in the Bible. In fact, he goes to great lengths to assure us of our present relationship with him and of the ocean full of blessings in store for us as his children. We need to picture such a special future for our children if we are serious about giving them our blessing. With this fourth element of the blessing, a child can get, gain that sense of security in the present and grow in confidence to serve God and others in the future. And the last element is an act of commitment which concerns the responsibility that goes with giving the blessing. See, for the patriarchs, not only their words, but God himself stood behind the blessing that they bestowed on their children. Several times God spoke directly through the angel of the Lord to the patriarchs, confirming the, his act of commitment to their family lives. Parents today, in particular, need to rely on the Lord to give them the strength and stay in power to confirm their children's blessing by um, expressing such an act of commitment. They do have God's word through the scriptures as a guide, plus the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. So why is act of commitment so important when it comes to bestowing the blessing? Words alone cannot communicate the blessing. They need to be backed up with a willingness to do everything possible to help <coughs> one less be successful. We can tell a child, you have the talent to be a good piano player, <coughs> but if we neglect to provide a piano for that child to practice on, our lack of commitment has undermined our message. When it comes to spending time together or develop or help develop a certain skill, so children here wait until the weekend. Then it comes. Wait until another weekend. They've heard this so many times that they no longer believe the words of the blessing. You're taught your walk, you have to line up. No? Your behavior with your words. 
So when the blessing doesn't happen, we have the marks of a missed blessing. People can spend years struggling to free themselves from their past. And as a result, they're never free to enjoy a committed relationship in the present. If hurtful patterns from the past are not faced and spoken, they are likely to repeat themselves in the next generation. Only when we can honestly look at our parents and our past are we truly free to leave them in a healthy way and cleave to others in the present relationships. If we are carrying around anger or resentment from the past, we are chained to that past and we are likely to repeat it. In gaining a better understanding of these homes that withhold the blessing and the characteristics they produce, we may also find we understand our parents' background better. Our parents were greatly influenced by growing up with their parents, and that experience affects us too. So take what was good from your parents and reject what was bad, because if you do not do that process, you will become like your parents, which you did not like. So here's a story to illustrate this point. Please say you love me, please, Brian's word trailed off into tears as he leaned over the now still form of his father. It was late at night in a large metropolitan hospital. Only the cold, white walls and the humming of a heart monitor kept Brian company. His tears revealed a deep inner pain and sensitivity that had tormented him for years. The emotional wounds now seemed beyond repair. Brian had flown nearly halfway across the country to be at his father's side in one last attempt to reconcile years of misunderstanding and resentment. All his life, Brian had been searching for his father's acceptance and approval but they always seemed just out of reach. Brian's father, a career Marine officer, wanted nothing more than this, his son to follow in his footsteps. With that in mind, he took every opportunity to instill in Brian the discipline and the backbone he would need as a Marine. Words of affection or tenderness were forbidden in their home. It was almost as if Brian's father thought a display of war might crack that tough exterior he was trying to create in his son. He drove Brian to participate in sports and to take elective classes that would best equip him to be an officer. But Brian's only praise for scoring a touchdown or doing well in a class was a lecture on how he could and have should have done better. After graduating from high school, Brian did enlist in the Marine Corps. It was the happiest day of his father's life. However, that joy was short-lived. Cited for attitude problems and disrespect for others, Brian was soon on report. After weeks of such report, one for a vicious fight with his drill instructor, <coughs> Brian was dishonorably discharged from the service as incorrigible. The news of Brian's dismissal from the Marines dealt a death blow to his relationship with his father. Brian was no longer welcome in his father's home, and for years there was no contact between them. During those years, Brian struggled with feelings of inferiority and lacked self-confidence. Even though he was above average in intelligence, he worked at the various jobs far below his abilities. Three times he got engaged, only to break the engagements just weeks before the weddings. He just couldn't believe that another person could really, really love him. We all need words of love and acceptance and encouragement. And if we don't get them, this could lead to two roads. The road of overachievement. You know, we become a workaholic. Or we could be the road of withdrawal. We're not even going to try. What's the use? We never measure up. We just never will. So we don't even try. So 
a life without the blessing. Let's examine a little closer the ways that being deprived of the blessing can show itself later in life. Without the blessing, children can become the seekers. Our people who are always searching for intimacy, but are seldom able to tolerate it. These are the people who feel tremendous fulfillment in the thrill of the courtship, but may have difficulty in sustaining a relationship of any kind, including marriage. Then you have the shattered. These are the people whose lives are deeply troubled over the loss of their parents' love and acceptance. Fear, anxiety, depression, and emotional withdrawal can often be traced to missing out on their family blessings. The smotherers, like a 2,000 pound sponge, these needy people react to missing their parents' blessing by sucking every bit of life and energy from a spouse, a child, a friend, even an entire congregation. Their past has left them so empty emotionally that they eventually drain those around them of the desire to help or even to listen. The angry. As long as people are angry with each other, they are emotionally chained together. Many adults, for instance, remain tightly linked to their parents because they are still furious over missing the blessing. They have never forgave or forgotten. As a result, the rabble of emotional chains distract them from intimacy in other relationships. And the weight of those iron wings keep them from moving forward in life. But detached. Quite a few children have missed out on the blessing, use the old proverb, once burned, twice shy, as a model. Having lost the blessing from an important person in their lives, once they spend a lifetime protecting themselves from it ever happening again, keeping the spouse, children, or even close friends at arm's length. They protect themselves, all right, at the price of inviting loneliness to take up residence in their lives. The driven, in this category, light up extreme perfectionists, workaholics, notoriously picky house cleaners, <coughs> and generally demanding people who go after getting their blessing the old-fashioned way. They try to earn it. The deluded. Like their driven counterparts, these people throw their time and energy and material resources into the pursuit of anything they hope will fulfill the sense of emptiness inside. But instead of focusing on achievement, they look for social status popularity, attention, and plenty of toys. They never quite understand that the blessing is a gift that cannot be bought. Only counterfeit blessings are for sale, usually at an exorbitant price. And they last only as long as the showroom shine on a new car. So these folks are constantly feeling their need to trade in one fake blessing for another big blessing in the seduced. Many people have missed out on their parents' blessing, look to fulfill their relationships needs in all the wrong places. Unmet needs for love and acceptance can tempt a person to sexual immorality. They're trying to meet a legitimate need in an illegitimate way. Substance abuse and other compulsive behavior can fall into this uh, category. <coughs> a drink, a pill, or a behavior used to cover up the hurt from empty relationships in the past or present, and addiction can easily result. If any of these scenarios ring true or partially true, don't worry. There is hope and help for anyone to lead the ranks of the unblessed and join the ranks of the blessed. In fact, every miss element of the blessing can be regained. What good news yeah. is that? So, but blessings are not just for children. Aaron, the high priest, would bless the people. You know, we use this as a benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord makes his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. You know, before I go to the work, you know, every day it builds out, he turns my car around, makes sure it's warm or it's cool, whatever the season. He carries my bags out to the car and I get into the car and I sit down and he puts his hand on me to give me a blessing. So Bill, if you want to come up and sh show how you do that blessing. So we get to bless adults here. You bless your wives, you bless your husbands, family, friends. Every morning when uh, Judy's sitting in the car, the motor's turned on and the car's running and she's ready to leave, I take a few moments to bless her this way. And I say, Judy, I bless you today, and now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May God's Holy Spirit anoint you with every gift of counseling and of ministry and give you great peace. And finally, may God the Father assign his mighty angels to surround you in this car to protect you and to bring you home safely tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Identity 
and legitimacy in your Father. Do you receive it? Amen. Amen. Well, then, yeah, we'll just close in prayer, and then we'll have Leah sing us a worship song. So let's close in prayer. Father, may our children never have to search for words or be left wondering if they are of value to us or to you. Help us to bless them, Father, without words. Help us to bless them with our words, with our actions, and with our <coughs> lives. Remind us not to leave our words to chance, but to choose to bless our sons or daughters all the days of our lives. In the name of Jesus, from whom all blessings flow, in Jesus' name.